Awesome. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today. Normally this is a podcast recording for number one leading ladies. We will also use it for that purpose. But what this really truly is, is an opportunity to be in front of an expert who wrote a book that is very, it's, it's made a big impression on myself and I've read it three times and I still can't remember all of the different uh, statistics that are in there. But for somebody who like me has a science background, I have a molecular and experimental degree in nutrition um, from a school in Texas. And for me, being able to explain things from a scientific perspective is really important when I'm trying to prove a concept or trying to get people to understand so the book you wrote, uh, Women Don't Ask, was amazing to me. That's why I've reread it so many times. Now, a lot of the concepts that we cover, I think, have helped me to understand and helped me to explain to, especially women, why when you're in a male-dominated industry such as commercial real estate, I'm in multifamily real estate, why we're able to sort of understand some things that we do, uh, tweak a few things that we do, and I've been able to have more success since employing a lot of things from this book. Uh, I just want to have you introduce yourself and then we can kind of talk a little bit more about, I guess, some of the, the key things that I think are really going to help the women that are listening to be able to uh, be leaders, be able to be involved in male dominated industries and not let us hold it, hold anything back and also be able to collaborate more with other women uh, because I find intellectual and intelligent women, we're able to really build each other up. So I'll let you go ahead and introduce yourself because I won't do it justice. Great. Okay, so I'm Sara Lashman. I'm the co-author with a woman named Linda Babcock of two books about women in negotiation. One is called Women Don't Ask, and the second is called Ask For It, How Women Can Use the Power of Negotiation to Get What They Really Want. And Women Don't Ask is a, a serious work of social science, although I wrote it. I think it's very uh, accessible, easy to read, but built on a very strong research foundation. Linda Babcock is a behavioral economist, so she did a lot of study, studies, lots of different methodologies. And what she found is that men uh, typically ask for things for themselves, things that will help them get ahead, about four times as frequently as women do. So what that means is if every three months or so, every quarter you get up your nerve and decide you're gonna go ask for something, the typical man is doing that 16 times a year. And that's a lot more. And he's not getting everything he's asking for, but just because he's asking for so many more things, not just money, but opportunities, access to resources, et cetera, it helps him edge ahead up the ladder a little bit faster, forward a little, you know, a little bit further sooner. So it's, something women are heavily socialized not to do, and there are good reasons why we are a little nervous about it, why we avoid it, but we pay a high price for not asking for what we want, not advocating for ourselves. And one of the reasons that we don't is that we feel like it'll elicit a backlash. People don't like it when women come off as too aggressive, too pushy, too demanding. And one of the things the second book really focuses on is how women can ask for what they want in ways that really work for women without coming off as pushy, bossy, threatening, demanding. And there are ways to do that. It, it's not you know, settle for nothing or settle for less or be, be pushy and obnoxious and get you know, termed whatever, you know, um, there's a, there's a, some middle ground. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, some of the things that I've done because we have this really awesome quality, I think just, just built in of being able to have intuition. So mm -hmm. being able to have that intuition, it's so funny because I've learned to listen to it more, but you're like, man, I bet it's this. And now I just call it out for what it is. I don't even like kind of wait for a week to, to go, okay, scientifically, I should wait till it proves itself. I'm just mm -hmm. like, I bet you it was that person calling that person. That's why that happened. But um, mm -hmm. now when it comes to the females that I work with, uh, we're kind of surrounding each other uh, from a perspective of people that understand or, or very similar. So like I mentioned, very intelligent women uh, and I'm not tooting my own horn, but you know, <laughs> but you're smart. You're super smart. most of us are pretty smart. Yeah. We seem to get along really well because it's, um, I don't really know why, but the thing is, is I think a lot of the concepts in the book talk about other women being around each other. And so because we're collaborative, our, our efforts are able to help us to have more success in groups uh, of us instead of being the token woman, like I usually am in a group of men in the commercial real estate uh, industry. I'll find them you know, withholding certain topics or stopping their conversation and kind of looking at me and I'll call them out on it. But um, it's, it's really important that we go ahead and ask for what we want. And 
Um, my intuition has led me when you have those really uncomfortable comments that you might be called the B word about or something. This, this mm -hmm. happened to my underwriter. She said yesterday when I dropped off at the airport, she said, my coworkers will call me the B word, you know, because I'll say, I'll look at a project and I'm a project manager and I'll say, this sucks, you know? And she's like, I'll just be honest. And they hate me, you know? And I'm like, well, I've, I found that my gut says when I say stuff like that, I have to say it with a smile, like, this sucks. We got to work on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, tomorrow, <laughs> really important. Yeah. That's really important. That's the only way I've been able to kind of smooth it over, kind of make it a joke a little bit, but be serious, kind of like look at them in the eye, but you know, be, uh, be lighthearted about it. So I'm looking forward to reading the second book as well. I, I actually haven't read that one. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say in the male dominated industry, I found there's a couple qualities that kind of we are not conscious of, I think that we do. And those certain things I find lead you to uh, concede more often, pull back more often. Uh, again, we're worried about what other people are thinking. And so sometimes we hold back what we're about to say, even though it needs to be said, worrying about other people's feelings. Uh, what would you say would be the top uh, two or three um, concepts that women really need to kind of start understanding to be able to be a leader and be able to get what they want? Well, if it's a negotiation and it's a serious one where the stakes are high and you care about it, the preparation piece is really critical. <laughs> Excuse me. Do your research. Find out what other people are getting, what other people are asking for. Find out, you know, not just at your own organization, but at peer or competitor organizations in allied fields where you might be marketable. Uh, you know, do that legwork. Excuse me, I'm going to have to take some water. <laughs> Sorry. Totally fine. I've got mine ready to go. Good, good. Um, and then if you're really nervous about it, especially if you're worried they're going to, you know, say I'm coming on too strong or I'm going to burst out and be, you know, too aggressive, I'm a big fan of role playing. Get together with somebody you trust, uh, brief them thoroughly about the negotiation, tell them what you're worried about, and play it through several times and get them to push your buttons, embarrass you, make you mad, hurt your feelings whatever, push back hard, whatever you're worried about, and then practice responding in calm ways that move things away from that sort of conflict, that abrasive friction spot uh, towards sort of joint problem solving. So they're like, oh my God, that's too much, you're crazy. And then you're like, oh, oh uh, uh, you never mind. Um, instead you say, well, all right, so we're really far apart or didn't mean to scare you. Um, <laughs> let's keep talking, maybe we can meet in the middle, maybe we can find some middle ground. If you practice what you're gonna say beforehand, you really practice, it feels a bit goofy. You're just so much better prepared if what you're worried about happens. And it's not just that you know what you're gonna say, you won't be surprised by the emotion it triggers where you're embarrassed or angry or you know your feelings are hurt. And it turns out it's the surprise as much as whatever it is that they've said uh, that tends to derail us. We're like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. I'm upset. I don't want to be around people when I'm upset because I know that's risky for women to be emotional. Um, so I'm going to get out of the room. Whereas if you had prepared and practiced and had those emotions triggered in the role play, it's much easier to see them for what they are, put them to the side and just keep going. So preparation, role playing. It's really great um, if you're not somebody who feels like you're good on your feet. I'm a big fan of taking an improv class. This is hard to do right now, obviously, but improv is a lot about, you know, sort of being able to pivot, being, you know, kind of ready in a focused but calm, uh, calm way. And there are a lot of improv companies that actually do training uh, in organizations do do business training okay. but you don't have to you know get your organization to do that if you can that's great they pay for it but a lot of them have night courses as well and what you want to do is get to feel kind of loose on your feet so whatever gets thrown at you even if you're not prepared you can like decide what you want to say I think you're so right and um, I have a background in my past where uh, I used to have a tendency to dissociate whenever something was highly emotional, highly stressful. Um, so psychologically, I had to learn how to stop doing that. And it's, it's hard, but in a mediation, in a hearing, in a, and I've, I've had to go through these things the last year, 
it's it's nuts. You've never been through it. You don't know how to deal with it. It's highly stressful. Someone's cross-examining you and calling you out on things that you don't want to discuss in front of other people, whatever. Um, but because of that dissociative ability for me to kind of like shut off, you know, that's actually good. So in those situations, uh, what I end up doing, so sometimes when you're um, working in a mediation, um, I'll just, you go to the restroom, take a pause, you know, you're not quite sure how to, hang, I'll call you back, you know, or because it was on the phone or it's a uh, person, but um, what I'll usually do is kind of re-ask the question because I'm like, whoa, what did you just say? Like, and I'll re-ask it and I'll probably re-ask it another two or three times just in a different way to see if I can get a different uh, piece of maybe what I'm, what I'm needing for them to explain better uh, or for them to really uh, show the underlying emotion behind the action of what they're saying. Um, then the other thing that's, I guess, good about kind of shutting off like that, uh, mm -hmm. is that I'm not only able to, uh, to ask questions that, you know, cause really what I'm feeling is like, oh, uh, I blanked and I didn't listen to what they said because I was somewhere else in La La Land. And mm -hmm. so then I'll just re-ask it 15 different ways. And then I'll ask clarifying situational questions where mm -hmm. I'm asking them. So what if I did it like this or what, like if, if they say no about something, they're like, well, we will not do that. I'm like, well, what if it was paid in advance? Or what if it was like this? Or what if it was packaged differently? Or what, and I keep doing that what if stuff until something sounds like they're, they're okay, that might be going in the right direction mm -hmm. uh, instead of having to uh, prepare ahead of time. I honestly hate preparing, but I understand what you're saying as far as at least going over the facts and preparing ahead of time. But um, I like to just fly by the seat of my pants. So. <laughs> um, well, some people are better at that than others. There are a couple things you said I want to uh, call out. One is I love the idea of saying, can we take a quick break? Yeah. Um, you know, can we pick this up in a couple of hours? Can I call you back this afternoon or, or tomorrow? Especially if you've heard something that you didn't find in your research, that you didn't expect, uh, something that throws you a little, you want to go back and do a little research, get on the phone, do some Googling. Uh, but also, if you just feel like things are going a little too fast, it's a great time to say, we take a break. I want to reflect on what we've already discussed. I don't want to make a hasty decision. I'm sure you don't want me to. And, you know, let's talk about it later. The other thing I love is asking people to clarify, ask them to restate. Um, it's really good for you. It gives you some time. But also, typically, if you ask the question, as you said, from a couple of different angles, you'll get a little more information. They will reveal something about what they are willing to do or about an experience in the past that is preventing them from hearing the benefits of your, uh, your proposal, that they're hung up on something that happened that really isn't relevant. And so then you can talk it through. The other thing about that is that it suggests you care about their, their situation. Tell me what's going on with you. What are your problems? What issues are, you know, holding you back? You know, how can I help? As opposed to, this is what I want. This is my position. Come, you know, come to me or, you know, whatever. It's going to be a, a push-pull. It's more, right, so tell me what's going on. And people uh, respond well to that. They think, okay, this is more of an ally and we're solving a problem together rather than we're adversaries and they're going to win or, you know, I'm going to win. Exactly. So one thing um, about men and women when it comes to negotiating. So uh, I've been in a negotiation like that with a woman. I've been in a negotiation like that with a man and, and very different. Um, but both of them ended up because it, why, why did we get to that place of mediation in the first place? We could have just sat down on a table, crossed yeah. each other, said, all right, what's up? Let's figure it out. But right. in the situation, it got pretty hostile, pretty whatever. The, yeah. the thing I was seeing on the other end was both of them were acting like autocratic leaders. Both of them were doing what you just said. And they're like, this is how it's going to go. You're going to go right. with me. This is the only option. And right. I'm like, there's not one option to everything. I mean, give me a break. So um, how would you say if somebody, because th that used to make me feel, I kind of turned it like I just did into like, I'm smiling and I think it's like a joke. You know, I'm like, okay, let's talk through this. You You're know, kidding. I'm intimidated and then back off and then kind of just, uh, concede. You know, if somebody comes into a uh, crossfire with somebody or you're, you're at work and it's your boss, somebody that is an autocratic leader, what would be a really good way to, to handle that? Um, you know, you can prepare for, you, you watch how they normally do things, you can, you know, but is there anything? Well, you... there are a couple of things. The preparation is really important. If you can find out that A, other people have gotten what you're asking for in the past, um, or B, they've suddenly got an influx of budget to, you know, whatever 
ramp up some something that is related to what you want to do or you talk to say the executive assistants in their department and they've said do it this way or he responds really well to you. all the research is really great if you still um you know we you know hit a, a locked door or a, a roadblock something you might say is i'd really love it if you could think about it just leave it there and then say you know maybe we could talk again tomorrow because you know they're in the midst of this like interpersonal dynamic i want to win i'm the boss um but when you're not facing them and they're not worried about dominating you and they might reflect on say, you know actually that would be good for business uh, that actually could make me look good or that could be good for the department my performance targets whatever you get them to uh to think about it it also shows that you're calm um yeah i think those are those are two good um you know what good approaches i said the research bring the data with you if you have any data any data you can lay out in front of someone increases the likelihood that they'll sort of understand what you're saying and try to meet you somewhere now it's good thing now you've got me going is you can get them to agree to one little piece of it because most negotiations aren't about just one thing money you know they're you know titles and space and resources and schedules and who you're going to know, whatever, get them to agree to one piece of it that increases their incentive to, you know, keep going and try to reach a, uh, you know, a, a, a final agreement of some sort. So you can maybe yield on something small that isn't that important to you. They've got to win, then they want to kind of reciprocate. There's a psychological dynamic there that's pretty common. People reciprocate when they feel like someone's given them something. That can be a good technique. Absolutely. What would you say, because I want to kind of figure out what led you to want to do the research and to be able to prove these numbers and things to organizations and kind of live out the same why that I'm living right now, where I want to bring more women into leadership positions in a male dominated industry, but it really helps to, you know, have the knowledge behind it. Was there something that was like a big lesson for you or something that was a personal big win for you that you said, you know, I want to give this to other people? What, what made you want to do this? Well, it's, you know, it's a funny a source of a, a, of a career, but my, I'm one of four kids. There are two boys and two girls, but my dad always said to all of us, don't take no for an answer the first three times. This is a really good rule of thumb. I'll have people say, wait, 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 you know, and I'm giving, well, you know, what about no, don't you understand? It's like, yeah, no, I don't really understand no. At least I don't understand it until I've heard it three times. And no is often just an opening gambit or it's based on in, uh, inaccurate or insufficient information, or it's uh, a, a no maybe. So it's just this idea that life is a little bit more, whatever, negotiable, I guess, um, than a lot of us think, especially in the Western world where, you know, the price is the price, there's a sticker, there's a tag. Um, we're not as inclined to say, well, let's talk about it a little bit more, maybe we can make it work. And that was a lesson I got really early on from my dad. That's awesome that you had that. It For me, yeah, it was definitely, it is what it is, you know, mm -hmm. and I think it was a combination of your book, uh, Never, yes, or Never Split the Difference by Chris mm -hmm. Voss and Getting to Yes mm -hmm. and a couple of other body language books that, you know, I was trying to kind of relearn for me. Uh, the way that I interact with people because I realized the background that I came from, I was really not taught how to, to read humans and be able to kind of make them feel good and give them what they want. It was more about kind of being an autocratic leader or being quiet and doing your own thing. So uh, those are the alternatives. Yeah. So yeah. are there really any other resources? I love that, you know, this book is specifically about women. So it's great. Mm -hmm. Are besides your two books are there really any other educational resources that are out there that you guys have available uh or any yeah anything well there are a couple of things i uh, you know if you live in a town a city a place where there's a business school i'm a big fan of going and taking an exec ed course and practicing negotiating you practice over 12 13 weeks three hours a week lots of different scenarios people you don't know very well it's a great investment in yourself um, there are also things like you know Harvard uh, program on negotiation the Harvard Kennedy School the Harvard uh, Business School 
uh, have, and this is also true, MIT Sloan School, Stanford, you know, many, many schools have like week long camps, you know, adult camps, programs where you can maybe take a week's vacation or go every, you know, three long weekends or something. And, uh, you know, it's usually not just negotiation, there's more business leadership stuff, but that can be really useful. You named some very good books. Um, Deborah Cold, ha Cold has a book called Shadow Negotiations, which I think can be useful for women. Um, uh, Iris Bonet has a book called What Works for Women at Work, what, what Works for Women, and it's research about the things that really make a difference in the workplace, and a lot of the stuff we think matters, mentoring programs, employee resource groups, affinity groups, a lot of it's well-intentioned, they're not bad, but they don't really get women up into the higher ranks of their organization. So uh, Joan Williams, Joan C. Williams, she's at, at Hastings Law School, I think, in, um, I think it's at Berkeley, she has another book also called What Works. The titles are so similar, I'm not sure which one is which, but also has some good research in it. Thank you very much for that. I mean, it's hard to find those kinds of resources, you know, and like I mentioned, when you can kind of get into a group of women or you're listening to it from a woman's perspective, it just really helps to, I think, make you, like those negative stereotypes that you have about like, I'm not gonna be good at negotiating, or I'm not good at math or whatnot. It's already kind of like bringing down your ability to soak it in as much or do as well, I, I believe. So that's, that's key. And so it's interesting, some feedback that I get sometimes for my why and what I'm doing is, you know, um, are you, are you a sexist, you know, against men? I'm like, no, absolutely not. Because in my, uh, in my industry, if I was going to get where I am now, I would have, wouldn't have gotten here without having a sponsor, without having somebody who said, I'm going to vouch for you financially. I'm going to you know, help a guarantor alone. I'm going to tell them you can close because I have before. I'm going to help you get in front of the right people who do legitimate business and that will actually respect you and not try to, you know, push you out of this business, that, that kind of stuff, you know, so definitely not. And uh, I find that those men are, are real true leaders and they want everybody to do well. It's not just about a certain group of people that do well, but for me, there's, I find that 50% of our population's not living up to our potential, you know, as far as what we can produce, what we can do, um, how we can help each other. And so if we had that, you know, I, I couldn't imagine what this planet would be like, you know, if we were able to have everybody uh, live up to our full potential, you know? Yeah, the social costs of not taking advantage of women's skills, energy, imagination, creativity are, are huge. And even just the simple cost of not paying women equally, women tend to reinvest their money into their communities more than men do. They tend to, you know, invest them in taking care of their families. Any society to be successful needs to raise healthy, productive citizens, and that's something women do more than men. But I like to say our books, Linda's and my books, they're not anti-men. They're not blaming men. Men are the products of the same socialization that we're the products of. They also have had a lot of noise in their ears since they were babies about what men do and what women do and how they may not be the same. But there are lots of men who are, as you said, eager to be great leaders for everybody or for their organizations and just want to know where the talent is and promote it. And the other thing I would say is that millennials, for all the every bad press they get, tend to be millennial men, tend to want a lot of what women have always want. They want more time with their families. They don't want to work like their boomer dads who were gone 90 hours a week and could never come to their soccer games. They want more time for their, whatever, their hobbies, their causes. They want more balance in their lives. And they're also, I mean, millennial men have grown up with sometimes grandmothers who work, certainly mothers who work, sisters, you know, aunts, cousins, friends, wives. And so it's not uh, it disorient. Does, it, it seems like the world is normal when there are lots of women around and they're happy to help promote the ones who are talented. Yeah. So go millennials. No, no, seriously. I was going to say, I find that uh, millennial women tend to be more collaborative. So I've had a couple of, you know, business partnerships where I work with people, well, a woman that was you know, 30 years older than me and that there's nothing wrong with that at all. But our mm -hmm. ideas of how to do things were a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and, and exactly because of that, because I think she thought that you had, if you're going to do something or get your way or whatnot, that the only way to do it was to make it, make it forced, you know, and right. so then that became a legal force. And then, you know, and right. 
kind of some of the hardest stuff I've ever been through, but you know, big lesson. Whereas now I'm putting together a partnership of uh, four of us or almost five, but different women. And for the most part, we're all, all millennials. And two mm -hmm. of us are, are a little bit older than millennials, but I mean, pretty much the same idea or they have kids that are millennials. So, you know, and, and they're single moms with those kids. So they're like friends, you know, um, yeah but it's a, it's a different experience this go round. Um, and you know, I want to do more of that in the world. Now, how can I, and, and the rest of us that are watching this or listening to this, how can we, um, help to elevate women without, so I feel like I always have to give a disclaimer. Like I mentioned to you earlier, somebody said something to me about, you know, are you sexist? And I feel like I have to explain it, but I mean, I actually never feel like I want to explain it, but I just do. I'm just like, no, absolutely not. And here's why. Um, is there a certain point in time where that will stop and people will realize that, you know, yes, we need more women in the workforce. We need more women in tech. We need more women in different industries that um, are going to be taking off. Uh, I don't know if it was your book or where I read this, but I think it said in the next 10 years, as of a couple of years ago, 80 some odd percent of women's jobs are going to disappear because of technology and some other things that are going to automate processes that women typically are doing. Um, and so it's so important to, bring more women into a lot of different industries that are male dominated, but I'm not sexist. How do you, I don't know. I don't know how to ask that question. When is that going to change or what do I, do I need to even explain myself? Well, you know, now we're talking about politics a little bit. Yeah. Uh, things will change when we have, you know, high quality state sponsored childcare, honestly. Um, in societies where they do, women have more children, but they go back to work and they don't, having children isn't perceived as a liability. Oh, I don't wanna hire this young woman or I don't wanna give her this opportunity because she's probably just gonna have a kid. Um, and when women know that their families are well taken care of, they're happy and to go back to work and put their whole selves into it. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I think more social support for women working and for you know, greater balance. The uh, pandemic has revealed a lot about uh, you know, how we balance work and home with our male partners and they can have the best intentions, but when push comes to shove and there's really uh, you know, an emergency, women tend to pick up more of the slack. And I think that is changing with millennial men, but these ideas, these received ideas about masculinity, what masculinity means, are also pretty loud in people's ears. And being a good breadwinner, bringing home the bacon, being super successful, and making that your number one priority is something that is not such a, a, a strong message that women get. But as women are able to participate fully because they have those social supports, I think it will just seem, it will seem normal. What, uh, what countries right now have that social support? Uh, France has great uh, state-sponsored childcare, and you'll see that the really good uh, comparative example, um, the birth rate in France is much higher than it is in Germany. Germany went at it a different way, which is Germany guarantees women three years off for each kid. And that seems like that's very generous, but if you take three years off, even once in your career during your childbearing, you're gonna lose step. And so what happens is German women don't have as so many babies. Um, and that, you know, one reason Germany welcomed all those immigrants in the last few years is because they're not replacing themselves. So they need that immigrant labor. Scandinavian countries typically have very good uh, childcare and they have very stable, uh, strong economies. Interesting because I've seen exactly kind of what you said after you know COVID or actually during the lockdown when they're like their school is school starting is it not because you know I got to work I've got stuff to do whatever right. and um, how do we deal with that well my girlfriend in California and then my girlfriend's in Texas they're both they're all single moms and they deal with it differently where uh, the ones in California they actually got together uh, one of the moms who's a teacher and she wasn't going back to school I don't remember exactly how they set it up but basically put together a community learning group where every so often they would, all the kids would go to her and they would kind of like trade, but she would do lessons and go through certain things that they were supposed to be doing online, but their mom needs to be working on her own different job and can't be going through all five modules or all five meetings that they have during that day or whatnot with them, you know? Mm -hmm. So I thought that that was awesome. And so I guess that's already happening in other places in the world. And so 
that would make more sense as far as, like you said, being able to concentrate on work and being able to, that's actually one of my fears and why I don't have kids um, is because, you know, I'm very independent and I do my own thing and I may adopt on my own. I may marry somebody when it is the right situation, but it's not like a requirement for me um, mm -hmm. if I wanted to have a child. But my fear would be exactly that I wouldn't have enough time or I wouldn't have enough whatever it takes, you know, to be able to be a good mom. But really all it is, is being able to focus on me, build me, and then they can build them in school, right? And then be able to collaboratively come together when we're done doing our things for the day. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how to put a spear into that, but I'm really glad that you said something that I didn't know. You know, I knew I would learn something awesome on this, um, on this interview. What would you say, uh, normally one of the questions that we ask on the podcast is when somebody is uh, getting a business started. So there's usually some some level of, you know, I, I don't believe in myself, some level of like that little guy in your head who's telling you you're not good enough, uh, or family members around you, or a spouse, or um, maybe there is none of that, and it's just in your head, but regardless, you have to get past mentally that point, and then on top of that, uh, the financial part of it. So uh, for us, we're really good savers, we're really good at donating, but not necessarily in investing and, and making, uh, ma doing things for ourselves you know, like that investing. So, um, so typically when it comes to bootstrapping a business, um, I always want to know, well, how did you do it? You know, so when you got started, um, getting your concept out to the public, uh, writing a book, I'm not sure if that was a partnership or whatnot. Usually people, when they get started before they get traction, like, like me, my first business was done on credit cards, you know what I mean? Or whether it's a co-signer here or you live in your parents' house or whatever, how did you get going and how did you get past that point in getting to traction? Well, I was lucky that I met Linda Babcock because Linda had this insight into her graduate students. She knew that this was a difference that male graduate students would come say, hey, I need this. Can you help me with that? Are there funds, resources uh, for such and such? And then the women would come and say, you know, how can you give it to him? I would have, that would have been great. Um, why couldn't I have that? And she was like, well, you know, you didn't ask. He asked, so she recognized this and she was very interested in negotiation anyway and she thought, let me see if there's more here. And so I met her at that critical moment when she was thinking, I think, you know, maybe there's a book. And she's an academic, so she wanted to work with a non-academic writer. And I just loved her, I loved the idea. It really aligned with my childhood conditioning, you know, from my father and it, you know, Together we believed in each other and we believed in the ideas. But I wanna say just, you know, response to some of what you were talking about is, and I'm not sure of the exact data at this moment, but I think women own something like 40% or, or, you know, majority owners in 40% of the private businesses in this country, but we only get about 3% of the investment capital, the angel investors, who are you know helping finance to get um, businesses off the ground uh, off the ground sorry and to a significant degree that's because women don't ask for enough they don't ask at all or when they ask they ask for the bare minimum they think they need in order to get going and men ask for more and so women's businesses are often undercapitalized which puts them under a lot of stress but also puts the business itself at risk, their employees at risk, the community where those employees live at risk. So a big piece there is go in and ask for more. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so that's kind of the fun part for me about having this partnership with a couple of women who are newer to what we're doing. There, there's so many different fees that you can structure in what we're doing, whether it's um, the acquisition fee, disposition fee, uh, management fee, uh, there's so many different parts to it and a lot of it is based on someone that has experience that they would be able to put that in the deal and say well this is such a good deal and I'm so experienced that I could ask for these things and when you get started you kind of I mean I've lived through it where I was like I asked for way too little for the last you know two yeah. years or whatever <laughs> I'm the only one doing the work but comparatively to where I came from what I was doing for work I was making decent money but this was a lot more money and so I thought okay let's kind of go with what you're used to instead of Real, I already knew how much effort it was going to take, but once I was living it, I, you know, anyway, I immediately regretted that. So what I'm doing now is I'm putting the facts in front of these ladies and saying, okay, what do you want? Tell me what you want. Like, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to ask you to tell me what you want. And I'm going to kind of make an example out of it because luckily we're able to fund this certain deal we're doing right now pretty easily. 
and then I'm going to hunt for another deal. And then on the next one, you know, I'll show them how I broke it down and how I'm, I took what I did from the raise and what I'm doing. And mm -hmm. I've like, I've, I said it over and over again, but until you see it, you know, it's not real. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm like, next time you bring the deal, you're getting 75% of this, you know, this, 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 and it really adds up, especially if we're the next deal, we're going after 300 units, you know, so it's going to be a, a different thing. So anyway, but uh, to get them to, to start asking, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I don't mind, go, we'll go back and forth 18 times until we figure out what works for everybody, you know. Um, how would you, the last question I have is how would you get somebody to start practicing on a daily basis, uh, you know, not just role playing, but any other way to start asking more? Which, yeah. So in our second book, Ask For It, Linda and I devised something we call the negotiation gym with the idea that, you know, you get up your negotiating muscles, you uh, strengthen them, and it's a six-week program, and you don't have to do it in six sequential weeks, but each week we have the focus on a different challenge or a different difficulty that uh, women in particular run into when they're trying to negotiate. And we send you out to negotiate little things, not, you know, whatever, the stakes are high, make or break your career things, but smaller things, maybe not at work. You can start with, you know, whatever, it's September, what is it, September 10th, and the summer merchandise is still in your favorite boutique. There's something you've had your eye on. They haven't marked it down enough. Go in and say, could you give it to me for 20% less? Or you're at the farmer's market, you want to buy tomatoes in bulk, their price is uh, the same, could, you know try negotiating lots of little things around in your life and you will be surprised. Again, we think there's a sticker price. We think there's a tag. How many things are negotiable that you didn't think were negotiable? And, you know, in the last downturn, 2008, it was pretty well reported that a lot of the big box stores were saying quietly to their associates, if somebody tries to negotiate, go ahead and negotiate. We'd rather sell the air conditioner or sell the refrigerator than have them walk out and buy it somewhere else. So that can be great just to find out many more things are negotiable than you think. Then we push you to ask for twice as much as you think you can get. You'll be surprised. And that is really a good lesson in you're always going to be aiming too low. Aim higher. Um, ask for things you think it's not okay to ask for because you're a nice girl and nice girl, you know, whatever. Um, and then there's my favorite week is when we send women out to ask for things they know they absolutely cannot get. Because we are really afraid of hearing no. Uh, the research is men's self-esteem is more sta stable, women's fluctuates more in response to praise, criticism, success, failure, whatever. And so we're afraid of no, and so we don't ask at all. And it's great to go out and hear, yeah, no, sorry, and feel like, I'm all right. I can survive hearing no. And about, I don't know how long ago it was, there was one summer when the prices, price of gas was sky high and Linda went out and tried to negotiate the cost of a tank of gas with, you know, some kid at a 7-Eleven or something. And he laughed at her and she went back to her graduate students and she said, he laughed at me. I'm okay. So, uh, I recommend it. Um, another thing that people do at the negotiation gym, Linda's graduate students do this, uh, is that they will work with a gym buddy. They'll find a friend and they'll go through it together. And it's like when you go to the gym, you keep each other going, you keep each other honest, you whatever, debrief with one another, uh, egg each other on to ask for more and more and more. And uh, that can also make it more fun. That's awesome. That's definitely something I'm going to go and do right now. Okay. Uh, all of our listeners and viewers uh, of the, the podcast, or this will actually end up being uh, in a couple different places. But um, if anyone has any questions for you, wants to get a hold of you, um, wants to know more about how they can get involved with any um, initiatives that you have moving forward, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Well, if you go to my website, which is just my name, saralashover.com, there is a form where you can uh, connect with me and I'll respond quickly. Awesome. Sorry, you have been awesome today. Thank you so much. And you've helped me already um, get connected with a few things that I was honestly nervous emailing you about and asking for, but then things happened. So like this interview, I was so excited for. It's probably one of my most exciting ones I've ever had. Uh, and I'm really excited for everybody that uh, has been listening this whole time to be on here and then to, to share this. So, uh, so thank you so much. It's been delightful talking to you. Take care. Thanks for having me. Thank you.